Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Microgreens are all the rage in high-end restaurants. Today, we're going to talk about growing them. Also, mice and rats would love to call your house home. We'll talk about getting rid of them inside and keeping them outside. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Dr. Natalie Baumgartner. Natalie is the Residential and Consumer Horticulture Specialist for UT Extension. And Mr. D is here today. Glad to be here. Thanks for joining us. All right, Natalie, microgreens. Okay, they're all the rage now. So what are they? Yeah, so what's okay. the deal, right? right. Well, yeah, what's the deal? they are a great way to add both color and flavor and a little bit of novelty to all, okay. sorts, of, uh, all sorts of dishes. They can be used as a garnish on top of uh, soups and salads, or they can be used as an entire salad all to themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I see a couple of folks on the set, you know, watching that pretty closely there. So uh, <laughs> they, they are, they are a little bit tasty. dangerous to transport <laughs> around the state. It's hard to keep them intact. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what crops can be grown as microgreens? Pretty much anything that has an edible leaf and stem. Okay. So some of the most common are cool season crops in the cabbage and broccoli family, sure. so brassicas. Um, I have cabbage, I have broccoli in here. There are a lot of herbs that are also commonly grown. Some of the highest value microgreens. The commercial growers grow basil, so that's okay. one of the most sure. common. Cilantro, some of the other herbs, and uh, and a lot of leafy crops like lettuce. I have amaranth here, so okay. really a range. Mm -hmm. okay. Even root crops. Pigweed. Yeah, I knew you were going to say pigweed when you said amaranth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, uh, we eat it early, though, before we spread any seeds. Right. Or anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cousin of red root pigweed right there. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So what media are you growing them in? Um, I think the simplest way for okay. beginners to grow is to use a uh, soilless germination mix. So one of the great things about it is, of course, it's sterile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's very fine, and uh, it holds uh, moisture, it drains well, and one of the best things about it is a lot of time if you buy it, it'll have a slight fertilizer charge in it. Mm -hmm. And for a one to two week crop, like we can grow microgreens in such a short period of time, that may be all the fertilizer that okay. we need. One to two weeks. Yeah, these, get those everything here is one week old. These were seeded a week ago today. Hmm. And that's, that's uh, pretty good. Yeah, yeah, so they grow pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. It makes a pretty good stand, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, where can we grow these? I mean, can you grow them in your house, outside? Of, uh, yeah, what do you think? so they are, of course, they are vegetable crops, so they mm -hmm. do need a pretty um, good level of light, but not as high a light levels as a mature crop would or a fruiting crop. Okay. So we can grow these in sheltered porches. You know, we don't want bright right. outdoor sun because they dry out so quickly and they can desiccate. Um, but... Uh, but bright indoor spaces, I've grown them in the summertime, you know, in my living room that gets good light from okay. a patio door, home greenhouses. So um, once we get into winter and the natural light levels are lower, we might need a little bit of extra light. But even a small fluorescent light over these guys oh, cool. in your house okay. can, uh, can grow them pretty well in the fall to, to wintertime. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about basic care. Yeah, so, so basic care, we will we'll direct seed these and a lot of the small seeded crops like turnip, mustard, uh, cabbage, and kale. We don't even need to cover. We'll just sprinkle mm. along the top of the media and moisten very well. And um, they'll be up in just uh, one to three days, most of those quick germinating crops. And indoor or regular house temperatures, you know, in that 60 to 75 degree okay. range will help uh, most of those. And those are cool season crops, sure, right? Sure, so they germinate. Sure relatively uh, rapidly, and then once we get them germinated, we'll generally water them from, from the bottom. Okay, yeah. So that, that helps us okay. lower the risk of plant disease. These are seeded pretty closely. Right. So the drier <laughs> we can keep the stems, the healthier we can keep the plants. And if we have a fertilizer charge in our media, a d once daily, once every couple of days, um, watering from the bottom is, is our, you know, our main, hmm. main care. We need good air movement you okay. know, so that we can... Uh, Keep them, keep them healthy and, uh, and grown well and, and good light. But um, generally, 10 days to two weeks, um, we're to a harvestable stage for a lot of these crops. Mm -hmm. Wow, I think Mr. D can handle that, huh? 
A week yep. to 10 days? Pretty good. <laughs> and uh, can you tell us, I mean, what you have here, the specific, uh, you know, plants here? Yes, okay. yes. So a lot of these are, uh, are in the brassica family. Over here we have turnips, which are uh, mild. They're oftentimes eaten as a microgreen. Do we need to turn it? Then, um, need to turn it? <laughs> that we sometimes have um, in, in a root crop. We have mustard, uh, lettuce which can provide a good range of color. Okay. Um, not one of your strongest flavored crops. Um, <laughs> kale, uh, red cabbage, which is of course beautiful for its color. Some of the kind of sharper uh, flavors, a little bit more zest might be arugula that we have uh, yeah. right here. Uh, cress is also one that we'll use in just small quantities. Basil, you can see the basil yes. is one of our <laughs> slowest growing yeah. crops, which I mentioned it was a higher yeah. value. So that's kind of why basil is expensive. It's uh, one of the slowest uh, growing crops. And then this is amaranth, which is actually a warm season okay. crop. Many of these are cool season crops, basil um, uh, being a warm season crop and, and amaranth. This is cilantro, one of my favorite ones. Yeah, I was going uh, to ask you which one did you like? Yeah, yeah. as a microgreen. It is a little bit slower uh, germinating. Some that I don't have that are um, really common are the, some of the larger seeded crops, like peas. Hmm. Pea tendrils are, are excellent. Okay. Um, but, you know, we'll need to grow them in a little bit larger um, space, a little bit more media than we have here. Uh, beets and chard can be great. They provide beautiful color. Yeah. Um, rainbow Swiss chard can um, really like the, be a yeah, beautiful like microgreen. Yeah, I like the color of the chard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about that? So tell me, how do you know when they're ready, though? Well, we can really eat them whenever <laughs> we ourselves are ready. <laughs> All right, home, so, ready. Uh, yeah, so it's <laughs> like really that. a lot about how large we want the plant okay. to be, right? If you're growing them to sell, you want to get them a little bit bigger than this. These are what we call cotyledons. Right. So these okay. are the seed yeah. leaves. Yeah. Um, we don't have true leaves. That's why you may not be able to look at these and recognize them. If we had true leaves, um, the cabbage and the broccoli and the kale and the basil, everything would look more familiar uh, to you. But these are all uh, seed leaves, and we can certainly eat them uh, at this size. Um, but oftentimes, uh, we'll let them grow just a little bit larger, so we'll have okay. slightly more weight. Um, and uh, and then we'll, we'll harvest those with true leaves on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, how would you harvest them and store them? Um, we'll just harvest them, you know, with a clean pair of kitchen shears. Okay. Um, and and it's really a by hand job, so we'll just carefully uh, separate them and harvest as close to the media surface as we can without picking up any particulates uh, on our on our scissors. I really don't like to store them for a long oh, time. Okay, you don't. Um, okay. If you're growing them in your uh, home, you can just harvest as as you need. Um, store them right there. Yeah, yeah <laughs> we're, right, we're storing them upright. We're storing them alive. Um, they can certainly uh, be washed and dried well and put in a, a plastic container and stored for a few days in your refrigerator. But, um, but I just let them grow until I was ready to eat them, growing so, them in my So home. when we're ready, then yes. we can go ahead and get yeah. started, right? <laughs> it is, it's a self-service buffet right here. All right, well Nellie, we appreciate that. Thanks much. All right, thanks All right. a lot. <laughs>from which, you know, roots arise, or mm -hmm. nodes, and then, you know, uh, an iris has a rhizome. A lot Johnson, of our plants have, Johnson yeah, grass. Johnson grass Bermuda has a grass. Yeah, 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 all have rhizomes. So it's kind of interesting that people think it's a root, but it's really mm -hmm. not, you know, botanically correct, it is a underground stem. All right, Mr. D, let's get rid of those rodents. I, I see we have a table full of uh, traps here. We have an assortment. We, we have an, it's almost mind-boggling, <laughs> the, the options that you have where uh, mice are concerned. Oh, man. Uh, what I would prefer happen is that they not come in. Right. Where you don't have to That's use right. any of these, and you can use hardware cloth to prevent that from happening. Um, but... You know, mice, it's kind of, it's hard to believe, but mice, the, the bones in a mouse's skull are movable. Oh, man. And they have the ability to get through any hole that's larger than a quarter of an inch. Oh, and this is qu a quarter inch hardware cloth. So if you have a quarter inch hardware cloth, that will prevent uh, a mouse from getting in there. I've got an example. Oh, boy. Uh, 
of a, a quarter inch hole. So now they can't get through that quarter inch hole, but if it's any larger than the quarter inch hole that we have over here, uh, then they can get through that. Rats, you know, even a big old rat, they also, you know, they're a rodent and they, their skull bones are uh, movable and, and they can get through a hole that's larger than one half inch. So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you, need, you need to use solid aluminum or solid steel or something that is a quarter inch or smaller where hardware cloth is concerned if you're going to try to use the exclusion method. Okay. Uh, now, sometimes if you're using the exclusion method, you, you may be uh, trapping them inside your house. So if that's the case, then you still got to go with See, these, yeah, with these other options oh, that we have yeah. here. Uh, there are several, uh, let's, we'll talk about traps okay. first. There okay. are several traps around. Uh, somebody once said that if you build a better mouse trap, the world will be the path to your door. I don't know whether that <laughs> happened to Mr. Victor, but this is a, a Victor mouse trap, and it's been around for 100 years, right. I understand. And I don't know. How many did you say have been sold? One billion. One billion of <laughs> one these billion. have been sold. And and I'm going to try to set one here without mashing my fingers, but I am going to put my glasses on. Oh, yeah. Me. Do that. Uh, I may get, will you hold this for me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jump right in there and help you out. Yeah. So I'm probably going to get, no, okay. Uh, and, and the way this trap works, you, you apply bait and... You know, my whole life, we only had one kind of bait that we used, cheese. I'm not sure mice like cheese, but put a little piece, just a little bitty piece of cheese or mm -hmm. a little bitty piece of peanut butter or something like that right there. And when Mr. Mouse comes along and touches it, gotcha. so long, Mr. Mouse. All right. <laughs> uh, there are improved varieties. I, I, don't, I hesitate to say improved. Maybe they're not improved. I don't know. I mean, that's... That, does the trick, I'm pretty sure. But there are other mice trap, mouse traps out there. Uh, these are plastic. This one, I guess they get in there, they go around a bunch of corners, and you can actually see them in there because, oh, you know, gosh. and they're, they're looking out, trying to get out. So I guess that's a, uh, actually, this is a bait station. You, you put bait in okay, here. Right. The mice go in there and eat, and so they can leave. They right. can leave. Uh, the, I guess they can see the bait. Is it, and, and so and that would make them want to get, get in there, right. and, they, and they can leave. They'll they'll eat and leave. I like using bait station. This is a larger bait station right here. Uh, uh, this is really well is large enough. You can see it's it's plenty large that they um, even rats could get in there oh, wow. without any problem. Uh, that's probably at least a two inch hole, and and it's got you know basically they can run all the way through there run all the way through there, uh, off to the side. I've got bait right here. They'll go in here, they'll eat the bait, and then they can leave. And the reason I like the bait stations is because some of the, these poisons are anticoagulants or, or that, that will make the rodents thirsty. Mm. And they're nice enough to eat your poison and then they leave and go get a drink of water and die away right. from you. Right. With this critter, you're going to have to deal with him. You're going to have to, and, 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 and if you use a trap that actually catches them, I encourage you to check your traps once a day at least sure. because you don't want to leave them in there. You don't want to do the once a week thing because you'll know. I mean, the good thing is you'll know that you've caught something because oh, you, you can, can smell them. You can yeah, smell you can them smell when them. you get there. That's right. uh, this is a, another example of one. This is a single-use trap. Uh, I'm not really sure how it works. Let me see if I can... Uh, I don't know how to trigger it. Uh, there you go. But but apparently when you catch one, you just dispose of that. Right. I don't think there's any way to get the mouse out of there. No, it doesn't look like it. Yeah. So that oh, okay. that's another type. Uh, this one I understand is a humane type mouse trap. Uh, get it open here. Probably better put my glasses back on so I can get it put back together. You can see it's got a ramp. A little ramp that the little mice come and they'll walk up this ramp and then, and then, and then. Apparently it will go back up and it'll hold like a whole family of mice. Oh, you can put four or three or four <laughs> mice in there, and uh, the directions say take the mice uh, at least two miles away and then release them. Hmm. Uh, 
You know, I've got a couple other ideas about that. If you have anybody that has a cat, <laughs> you know, or a, a pet snake, <laughs> right, or yeah, something yeah. like that, that will pretty well guarantee that they won't m march two miles back <laughs> right. to your house and be back to your house before you get there. You know. But I mean, right. all kinds of uh, right. all kinds of traps here. Uh, uh, this is a, a type of uh, poison uh, or uh, uh, toxicant, uh, rodenticide, okay. I think is the proper term to use. Uh, it's a kind of a little cake. Um, I like the stations, the bait station, because, I mean, to get into this bait, bait station right here, you've got a key. You have to have a key to get in there, so you don't have to worry about kids or, oh, or your good. pets getting into it. I like the bait stations because they're a little bit more secure. You know, I don't think a child would pick this up and eat it, but um, I caught my daughter eating dog food one time. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and so, you know, you never know. Yeah, and, the, and, the and color act, makes that attractive, you know, for yeah, kids. And, and, yeah. and, and this, this yeah, right here, this is what I, the havoc is what I have in, inside this, this bait station. And actually, uh, my granddaughter uh, brought one of these little packets into my wife. I had one out in the garage. And she brought one in and said, can I eat this? Wow. Yeah. And, and this, these type of packets, I'm not sure are available for homeowners. I purchased it at this uh, in a bucket at a co-op. Okay. You can get, I've got a pretty large bucket of these. I use quite a few of these and I put them in my attic and under my house and things okay. like that. But I, now I don't, I try not to put them where Lila can get to them. Um, Mr. D, is there going to be a danger to other animals, you know, with these poisons on? I don't think so. Uh, I think the dose, the lethal dose that kills a rat or a mice is probably too small to kill mm -hmm. pets. I wouldn't, if you have pets, and, and if these critters go out and die out in the yard, I wouldn't let your pets eat them. You right. Know, if your pets eat squirrels and rabbits and things like that. I, and they pro I'm not sure that they would, but I do know these, these products are toxic to right. dogs and cats. Sure. I don't think they will eat the, the bait, uh, but they may chew on a critter that's dying, you know, in the process, but I don't think there's enough of a dose to be a problem. And I say that because as uh, stringent and strong as EPA is, I don't think they would allow us to have them on the market if that was a danger. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. D, we definitely appreciate that. And looking at that snap trap, voles. You yeah. get some voles with that You're too. Right. You're right. That's right. This works for voles. Yeah, All it works, works for voles. How about that? Right. So there you have it. Thank you, Mr. D. Appreciate that. Let's do a little bit of germination testing for some of our seeds. This packet was packed for five years ago, but we have some very straightforward and easy ways that we can test and see what the viability of these seed packets are. So I'm simply going to lay out a few seeds. 10 is nice because the mathematics are easy when we do some germination testing. So now we have 10 seeds simply laid out on a piece of paper towel. Then we'll fold it gently so they'll stay in place and then wet it down. You can slip this wettened packet into a small plastic bag. Leave it in a nice warm place. Cucumbers would like at least 70, 75, even up to 80 degrees for good germination. And then we can come back in a few days and test it. It's been a week. Let's come back and see what our germination test was on our cucumber seeds from 2013. We'll gently open the package and peel back our paper towel to be able to make a count. We have one, two, three seeds that haven't germinated, so that's about 70% germination, which would be what we'd expect from seeds that were a few years old. We're now free to plant the rest of that packet, seed just a little bit heavier than we normally would, and if we're careful, we might even be able to use these that are just germinated right here on this paper towel. All right, this is our Q&A session. Natalie, you jump in there and help us out, all right? All right, sure. All right, so here's our first via email. My summer squash formed very small fruit that fell off the plant. Mm -hmm. What caused that? Natalie, what do you think, yeah. since you know a little bit yeah. about vegetables well, here? Well, I would say they're probably dealing with a pollination mm. issue. And so, uh, you know, with, with squash, what we need is a male flower and a female flower. <laughs> and for uh, pollen to get from the male flower to the, to the female flower, which is, you know, where we're going to produce that fruit. And so if they're really drying and falling off, then 
maybe there just wasn't an insect population enough to uh, to achieve that pollination. There may have been stress or some other some other issue uh, going on there. Mm -hmm. Wow, what's the date? Mm -hmm. right. That's yeah, I think that pretty much. Sometimes do they put the female flowers on before the male flowers come on, so you lose some of those? Well, or is that... I mean, it. I guess it would be possible. Lots of times, what we'll see is plants will will produce male flowers before we see female flowers, and a lot of times the questions too. that you'd get would be, "I have flowers, but I don't have any fruit." fruit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah but if they're thing. seeing the fruit, you know, partially form and then dropping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Pollination. Yep. Okay. And usually with the female flower, you can tell it's a female flower mm -hmm. because you can see the little fruit right, right behind it. Look underneath yeah, of just, it, right? So, just yeah. right behind it, there's the, the little ovary, fruit. which will be your right. fruit. Yeah. yeah, right there behind the, the flower. <laughs> okay. Now, does heat have anything to do with that? You think? Because it's been a pretty hot it could. summer. And you know, with uh, with a lot of stress, anytime we have heat, we could yeah. have water stress and things like that. So it could could be a complicating factor. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's our next viewer email. What type of grass is this? Also, when you feed your lawn, do you also feed your weeds? I like that. And this is from Lou. Uh, so he wanted to know what kind of grass this was. And feeding your lawn, do you also feed those weeds? You think about that one, Mr. D. Do you feed the I'll weeds? I'll answer too? the part about feeding the weeds. Okay. Right. You can answer. You can identify. I can identify it. Yeah. 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 Is it crabgrass? Is it's crabgrass. No, it's crabgrass. It's crabgrass crab 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 and lespedeza mm -hmm. was also in. Yeah, in, in it, was well. in it was yeah. mixed in there. It was mixed in there. That's right. So you got a good lagoon in there with your uh -huh. grass. So <laughs> right. you got you got a couple of weeds out there. Uh, but yes, when you uh, we, when you use a weed and feed, uh, you uh, you are fertilizing your weeds as much as you're fertilizing your your desirable grass which is why I don't normally recommend using a weed and feed. I mm -hmm. recommend using a herbicide to kill the managing weeds. Managing your weeds. Yeah, right. <laughs> managing the weeds first, first and then, right. and then, and then uh, feeding your desired species. But I recommend. You know, you I, I'm the same with that. Yeah. If you grow a good, healthy stand of grass, mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about weeds as much because weeds, of course, are going to be competing for the same thing that your turf grasses are, uh, that they need to grow. So what, space, light, nutrients, Water. Just outnumber them with good things, yeah. Yeah, with, the, with the good grass if you can. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, Mr. Lupin, yeah, that was crabgrass and lespedeza. So, yeah, yeah, there you have it. You're right. <laughs> so, you need to get the crabgrass under control for sure. Right. And there's some products out there that you can use to do that. You can get the big box stores, and that should, that should do it. Fine. I should get it. All right, so here's our next viewer email. How do you take care of a ficus tree? I bought one last month, and all the leaves have fallen off of it. And this is from Danny. Uh, <laughs> It common, is common complaint. Uh, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm laughing because yeah, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I've been to uh, numerous office mm -hmm. buildings yeah. where I've seen ficus trees, and of course, you've seen leaves all over the place. Yeah. Um, here's the thing about them: they're real sensitive, so you can't move them around right. a, a lot. Light would be my first question, probably. Yeah, yeah, light. So yeah, if you have like high light, okay, mm -hmm. or if you have high temperatures, you know what that leads to? That means you have to water more, mm -hmm. and, and most people are not watering enough. And then guess what? If they're watering, they're watering too, too much, much. Right. Mm -hmm. right? So if you have the sun, if you have, uh, you know, conditions that are too dark and you have lower temperatures, then you don't have to water as much. But again, people water too much. Yeah. And something else I noticed too, though, if you have a ficus tree sitting under a vent. Yes, air movement. I mean, yeah. with real warm temperatures, probably the air conditioning has been running a lot. Uh -huh. I mean, it could be. It could be drafts, you could know, drafts. cold, cold air movement, or sometimes even just the change. Purchase a new plant, right? It's been outdoors in a garden center or something with bright yeah. light. You mm -hmm. bring it inside and it's adjusting, and it'll drop some leaves as it adjusts. That's usually what I see. Yeah, it usually goes from one light condition to the other. So it's usually high light to low light because yeah, you, most of the time you could be buying them at a nursery maybe, yeah. and it's been exposed to a lot of light, and then you mm -hmm. take it inside or whatever, and guess what? Mm -hmm. Light conditions are not the same. Yeah. So the tree is trying to say, hey, what's going on here? I need to compensate. So off goes the leaves. Oh. Yeah. But it's usually that or light conditions are too much water. Yeah. It's usually what mm -hmm. I see. But they are sensitive. They don't like to be moved a lot. All right, Danny, hopes that, hope that helps you out. Uh, here's our next viewer email. I am planting greens in my fall garden for the first time. Are there any pests or diseases I should be concerned about? And this is from Carol. So we'll start with our vegetable person here. Um, what do you think about that one, Allie? Well, 
I mean, certainly there are. I mean, I think cabbage worms maybe come to mind. There mm -hmm. are some mm -hmm. some of those leaf feeders. A lot of the greens that we eat are going to be brassica crops, mm -hmm. you know, in that family. So we can uh, we can keep an eye on those, protect them. Sometimes even row covers can be a great way to protect our fall okay. crops. Okay, yeah, I think about that. Um, yeah. But I think sometimes maybe even before we get to the pest and disease question, we'd think about how we get those established well, well yeah. Yeah, keeping yeah, yeah. them watered in and getting those plants transitioning well yeah. in the heat of the summer. You know, yeah. planting our fall crops, taking good care of them early on is sometimes one of the most important okay. steps. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Anything would, else would. to... Right. Yeah. And if you do get an infestation with uh, caterpillars or yeah. flea beetles mm -hmm. or something like that, the red book will tell you how to take care of them. Right, yep. mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, for the first time, so we're yeah, happy to know that she's actually yeah. going to consider, you know, going to uh, yeah. you know, greens. Yeah, so lettuce program. and kale, a great way to uh, to go into October and November. All right, so there you hear it from Natalie herself. <laughs> it's a great way to do that. All right, so Natalie, Mr. D, we're out of time. Thanks for doing it. All right, hey, thanks for having yeah. us. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org. And the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. You can find extension publications about the things we talked about on familyplotgarden.com. While you're there, take a look at the gardening calendar or ask us your gardening question. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.